Hello everyone, I welcome you all to the 14th lecture of this course. The 14th lecture is on nano artificial cells. So, in this lecture, we are going to learn what is artificial cell and how to make artificial RBC and also various applications of artificial cells. So, in this lecture, we are also going to learn what is synthetic cell and its various applications. So, in the previous lecture, we have learned how to replace the damaged tissue using tissue engineering approach. So, in this lecture, we are going to learn how to make an artificial cell and how to replace the damaged cells using the artificial cell approach. So, here this engineered artificial cells can be used to replace the dysfunctional cells and it may be used in the future to treat anemia, renal failure and many other health problems. Okay. So, here the biggest advantage in using nanomaterials in the fabrication of artificial cells is their small size. And as you know this biological cells have very high functional density and contain DNA coding for thousands of different proteins to carry out certain functions. So, engineering artificial cells with similar function is a significant challenge. Okay. So, with the help of nanotechnology, we could be able to achieve those challenges. And here, the small size allows a larger and more beneficial surface area to volume ratio. So, that is why when you use that nanomaterials for constructing artificial cells, that could be more beneficial. So, let us see the basic principles of early artificial cells. So, these artificial cells are made up of ultra thin artificial membrane. So, it is having intracellular as well as extracellular environment and here the content whatever you want to encapsulate that will be inside the artificial membrane and uh, this membrane is permeant. Okay. So, it will permeate the substrate and it can also release the product. Okay. So, these are the types of early artificial cells, we can encapsulate cells, enzymes, hemoglobin okay, and various other materials. So, let us see the present status of artificial cells. So, here you can see here, we can encapsulate cells, stem cells, enzymes and everything inside the membrane, artificial membrane. So, this membrane could be made up of polymeric or it could be made up of biodegradable membrane and lipid and protein based membranes. Okay. So, these artificial cells are available in various dimensions. It can be macro or micro or nano, depends on the cellular content which you want to encapsulate into artificial cells. So, let us see this in macro dimensions, we can encapsulate genetically engineered cells, stem cells and even microorganisms. And in micro dimensions, we can encapsulate enzymes or we can encapsulate some of the genetically engineered microorganisms and peptides and everything. And in the nano dimensions, using the nano dimension, we can make uh, blood substitutes or we can encapsulate enzymes and magnetic materials and drugs and other peptides. Okay. So, let us see this, uh, how we can encapsulate these materials into this polymeric artificial cells and also what are the various applications of these artificial cells. So, here the artificial cell or systems that uh, biomimic native cellular function to recapsulate either function or the structure and this artificial cell technology seeks to address the need for more efficient temporary solution. Okay. So, when compared to the tissue engineering, where you get the, uh, the whole tissue will be replaced, here we are going to focus mainly on the single type of cells. Okay. So, in contrast to tissue engineering, the field of artificial cells is concerned with singular cells okay, instead of the whole complex tissues. So, for example, here the pancreatic islet cells can be encapsulated into polymeric capsules and it can act like your pancreatic cells to produce insulin in case of diabetic patients and you can also encapsulate hepatocytes. So, that can be useful for the patient with the liver failure. Okay. And in some cases like in the treatment of enzyme and the single system defects, so we do not need even the complete cell. Okay. We can encapsulate only the particular enzyme. So, the application of whole cells may be detrimental in case of single enzyme defects. Okay. So, replacing the enzyme or the single system may be more efficient in those cases. And again, the application of nano biomaterials is necessary to both better biomimic the cellular system and also to construct a more efficient system than the nature itself. So, using this artificial cell technology, we can mimic the biological system and also we can make the better than the biological system. Okay. So, let us see how we can make it. And this is a cells in the artificial cells. So, here the cells are protected in the artificial membrane. Okay. So, here the cells inside the artificial cells protected from the immunorejection. So, when you inject the cells directly into the body, 
So that will be rejected by your immune system. But when you protect these cells in your polymeric capsules, so that will be protected from the immune rejection, okay, immune rejection. And here the oxygen and nutrients can easily pass through this, okay. And again, for example, if you are using these uh, pancreatic cells, so depends on the glucose level, it can secrete the insulin. And again, if you are encapsulating the liver cells into this, it will convert the waste metabolites and toxins, okay. So these are some of the other examples. So if you are encapsulating pancreatic cells, it will be secreting the insulin for diabetes patients. And if you are encapsulating the hepatocytes, it will support the liver function in the liver failure. And if you are encapsulating kidney cells, it will secrete erythropoietin to treat anemia. And the parathyroid cells to secrete parathyroid hormone to treat hypoparathyroidism. So we can also encapsulate genetically engineered cells, stem cells and even microorganisms, okay. So in this example, if you are encapsulating these islet cells, so it depends on the glucose level, it will produce the insulin and if you are using these genetically engineered cells, so it can produce various therapeutic factors that could be useful for various therapeutic applications. So let us see how to encapsulate the cells into the artificial cells. So here there are two methods. The first one is standard method of cell encapsulation. So here the cells will be encapsulated into a gel sphere and followed by that the membrane are formed around the gel sphere, okay, this green color is the membrane and then dissolve the gel to disperse the cells inside the artificial cells, okay. So finally, you dissolve the cells and disperse the cells into the artificial membrane. So here the major drawback is the cells trapped in the artificial cell membrane causing membrane weakness. You can see here some of this white color is your cells, okay. So it is some of the cells are on the membrane. So due to which the cells exposed to outside resulting in immunorejection. You can see here this white color is the cell and some of the cells are exposed to the outside environment, okay. So which will leads to membrane weakness as well as immune rejection, okay. So to overcome this, there is another method called two-step method. So in the two-step method, the first the cells are encapsulated into the alginate gel sphere, then these smaller gel spheres are encapsulated into larger gel sphere, okay. So then followed by that you form the membrane, this yellow color is the membrane. So then you dissolve these smaller spheres. So all the cells are evenly dissolved into the uh, artificial cell, okay. And you can see here all the cells are safe inside the membrane and uh, there is no cells exposed to the outside. So here the cells are not exposed to outside. So this artificial membrane remains intact. So let us see how to encapsulate the enzyme into these artificial cells. As I told you earlier, in some of the cases, we do not have to encapsulate the whole cell. So if you have some enzyme defects, you can encapsulate only the particular enzyme and that could be also act like a therapeutic artificial cells. So when you inject the enzyme directly, what happens is antibody will be produced against that or your WBC will attack, okay, and triptych enzymes will digest your enzymes. But when you encapsulate this enzyme into artificial cells, so it is not in contact with the external material, so all the enzymes are protected in the artificial cell membrane, okay. So when the substrate enter inside the artificial cell and it will convert the substrate into product and the product will be released, okay. So let us see some of the examples, okay. You can see here some of the disease like acatalysemia, it is due to lack of catalyzed enzyme and phenylketonuria, it is due to lack of phenylalanine ammonia lysase, okay. So when you encapsulate these enzymes into artificial cells, that could be useful for treating the patients with lack of the particular enzyme. And another thing is we can also use it for cancer therapy. For example, there are some of the tumors that are amino acid dependent tumors. For example, this enzyme like aspergenase, it can remove the aspergine and also this tyrosinase enzyme that will remove the tyrosine which is required for melanoma growth. So let us see some of the examples of enzyme artificial cells. For example, here this catalyst artificial cells for enzyme gene therapy was used in mice model which is lacking the catalase enzyme, okay. And we can also use this aspergenase artificial cells which could suppress the lymphosarcoma in mice model and also it can also suppress the melanoma, a fatal skin cancer. So we can encapsulate this enzyme into artificial cells and that could be useful for various therapeutic applications. And uh, there are four routes of administration for this enzyme artificial cells. So it could be implanted to work with the body cells or it could be injected, okay. 
or it could be retained in the chamber outside the body. So, the patient's body fluid can pass through and filter and purify and it can go back to the patient. And another thing is it could be taken orally and it will be removed normally by the uh, excretion process. And not only the cells or enzymes, we can also encapsulate the bacteria. So, you can see here the micro encapsulation of cholesterol removing bacteria Pseudomonas pictorum. So, we can use this kind of bacteria to remove the cholesterol from our body. And uh, this is a typical uh, cross section of an animal cell, you can see here it has a nucleus and various cellular organs like mitochondria, lysosome. Okay. So, the question is can we make similar kind of artificial cells. So, how to make such kind of artificial cells? You can see here this picture. So, each look like a small small capsules. So, the nucleus is looking like a small capsule and the mitochondria look like a small capsules. So, the idea is we can make a small small capsules based on lipid carriers okay, and we can put those small capsules into a big size capsule and we can make artificial biological cell. Okay. So, that is called capsosome. So, the capsosome is a polymer capsule containing multiple liposomes. Okay. So, the development of capsosome shows that the possibility of fabricating a biologically similar artificial cells or artificial organelles. So, we can use the liposome based small capsules. So, the each capsules can act like a mitochondria or nucleus or other cellular organelles and all those capsules will be in a big size capsules. Okay. So, this is complete setup is called as capsosome. So, which could mimic like your biological cell. So, the another development of artificial cell is use of silica coated beads for in vitro protein synthesis. So, the Lim et al found that we can use the beads that can encapsulate transcriptional and translation machinery for the synthesis of functional proteins. So, we can use the silica beads, okay. so that will have all the enzymes for your transcription and translation and it can also act like a transcription and translation machinery. So, the development of this type of nanoparticle so can lead to the efficient artificial cells development. Okay. So, let us see the capsosome, you can see here, so this is like your biological cells only. So, each intracellular compartment can have specific functions. Okay. For example, it can function like your nucleus or it can function like your mitochondria or it can function like your lysosome. So, all the small capsules are encapsulated into a big size lipid based carrier. So, it is a capsosome and which can mimic like your biological cell. So, next thing is magnetic material in artificial cell. So, similar to the capsosome, we can also add the magnetic particles to this capsosome and the advantage is we can direct the movement of artificial cells, we can move the artificial to the particular location using the external magnetic field and also we can remove this artificial cell after the reaction and again we can retain the artificial cell at specific site for an action. So, we can retain these artificial cells at a particular location using the external magnetic field so that it can release the more amount of drug or therapeutic molecule at the particular location. And another thing is if you are using in bioreactors, using the magnetic properties you can stir it or you can agitate it. So, the next breakthrough is like that we can use the nano biomaterials for making the artificial RBC that is red blood cells. Okay. So, one of the major finding in development of artificial cells is their possible use as oxygen carrier. Okay. So, which could be useful for treating the anemia and various other diseases. So, here the blood substitutes the main function is to carry the oxygen and also to remove the carbon dioxide from the body. Okay. So, here lot of research has been done. So, some of the examples like we can use the polyethylene glycol modified liposome encapsulated hemoglobin and also polymerosome encapsulated hemoglobin. So, which will act like your artificial RBC or as a blood substitute. So, recently some of the other examples like we can use a concentrated hemoglobin and we can encapsulate into polymeric carrier that is called as hemoglobin vesicle. So, these hemoglobin vesicles are found to have very good oxygen carrying capacity when compared to the normal RBC. So, here the hemoglobin molecules extracted from lead blood cells are modified by micro encapsulation or cross linkage to produce red blood cell substitutes. And the encapsulation and linkage process stabilize the hemoglobin molecules and also allow sterilization of the products to remove human immunodeficiency virus and other microorganisms. So, as I told you, these red blood cell substitutes 
are made up of polymers okay so it will allow the rbc substitutes to sterilize so which make sure that there is no viral infection in your blood sample okay and the membranes of artificial cells allow permeable molecules such as oxygen and substrates to enter and allow metabolic products and peptides and other materials to leave so as, as i told you earlier this membrane will permeate the uh, some of the molecules to enter into the artificial rbc and it will also allow the product to go out through the artificial cells so here in the artificial rbc so these are protected from immunological rejection because all the cells are encapsulated into the polymeric material so these are protected from the immunological rejection okay and we need a uh, rbc substitutes in most of the cases like uh, surgery or in emergency treatment okay so this modified hemoglobin does not contain red blood cell membrane so and therefore no blood group antigens so it can be used without the need for cross matching so as i told you earlier these rbc substitutes are made up of polymers so it don't have any blood group antigen on the surface so we can give this artificial rbc to any person like uh, if a person is having a group or b group or o group there is no restriction we can give this artificial rbc to any person with the any kind of blood group that is the advantage of this artificial rbc because it don't have any surface antigen okay so another advantage is this modified hemoglobin can be lyophilized and stored as a stable dried powder so that can be reconstituted with the appropriate salt solution just before the use so that means so usually the uh, rbc will be stored only for 42 days okay so in case of this artificial rbc we can store it for several months or it can be for years because we can lyophilize this polymeric rbc and we can keep it and whenever we need it we can just dissolve this lyophilized powder in a saline and we can use it that is the advantage of this artificial rbc so let us see some of the advantages so as i told you this artificial rbc will be having high oxygen carrying capacity when compared to the normal rbc and there is no blood group antigens so we can give this artificial rbc to any person with the any kind of blood group and when compared to the normal rbc it will have longer half life and also it is non toxic okay so how to make this artificial rbc so we have to extract the hemoglobin from the rbc and this rbc contain hemoglobin okay which is going to transport oxygen throughout the body so this rbc can be lysed in presence of pure water okay so just put the rbc into the water so that will lyse and release the hemoglobin so the question is can we inject the hemoglobin directly so we cannot inject the hemoglobin directly because so the hemoglobin must be cross linked when placed into the blood stream because the hemoglobin it breaks into dimers and which can travel through the capillary pores like holes and it will cause death okay so that's why the hemoglobin should be cross linked and this cross linked hemoglobin can no longer travel through the pores okay so we can encapsulate this cross linked hemoglobin into the polymer and we can use it like a artificial rbc so let us see the difference between the normal rbc as well as artificial rbc so here in the normal rbc will be having blood group antigens so we cannot give it to all and we cannot give it on the spot okay so we have to check the blood group and we have to check the compatibility then only we can give the uh, blood donation okay so also another problem is there is a chance for uh, infective agents like hiv okay and which we cannot remove from the blood and another thing is we can store that rbc at 4 degree only for 42 days and again some of the blood groups are limited availability so there is also major issue but in case of artificial rbc there is no blood group antigens so this artificial rbc can be given to any blood group a b o okay and here there is no infective agents because it can be removed or sterilized and here the membrane is stable and we can store it for a long time and we can lyophilize into powder form okay and whenever we need it we can reconstitute into uh, artificial rbc and we can use it okay and again another thing is unlimited availability so we can take hemoglobin from different sources and we can encapsulate into this artificial membrane and which can act like your artificial red blood cell 
So when you make the artificial cells, so the size is very very important parameter. So the several investigation has been done to identify the ideal size for uh, artificial RBC. So theoretically the normal RBC size is between 4 to 7 micrometer in diameter okay. and whenever you make a nanoparticle more than 200 nanometer, so that will be removed by your spleen and if your nanoparticle diameter is less than 70 nanometer, that will be removed by the liver. So we have to make a nanoparticle which is between 70 to 200 so that it could be useful for intravenous delivery and circulation. And we can also increase the circulation time by adding PEG. So that is called as pegylation, addition of polyethylene glycol that is called as pegylation. So we can add this polyethylene glycol, so that will improve the circulation and it will uh, improve the stability of the artificial cell. So here the nano dimension artificial RBC sh should have the following properties. It should contain little or no lipid in the membrane and persist in the circulation after infusion for a sufficient long time and should it should be stable in storage okay and also it remains stable after infusion for the duration of its function as a blood substitute okay and after the function is over it should be biodegraded okay so it should not induce any toxic response when it degrades inside the body next one is the membrane material and its degradation products have to be non toxic and again in addition to hemoglobin the nano artificial cells should contain important rbc enzymes like superoxide dismutase catalase carbonic anhydrase and other enzymes okay so because so the artificial rbc the function is not only carrying the oxygen so it has to remove the carbon dioxide and it, it should also remove the free radicals so you should have some other enzymes into the artificial rbc so that it can exactly mimic like your original rbc okay and this membrane should be permeable to reducing agents and or glucose okay so the membrane also should be permeable so that it can take the glucose and it can convert onto the product so let us see the difference you can see here the normal rbc the size is between 7 to 8 micrometer and here the artificial rbc the first artificial rbc in the size of 1 micrometer or larger and uh, later the size is reduced to 0.2 to 0.4 micron okay that is 200 to 400 nanometer this is lipid based nano rbc and uh, now what were we are having is biodegradable polymeric membrane nano rbc here the size is between 80 to 200 as i told you earlier it should be between 70 to 200 or 80 to 200 so that it could escape from the liver as well as spleen so this is a complete nano artificial rbc you can see here it is having hemoglobin for carrying oxygen and also it is having enzymes like carbonic anhydrase for removing the carbon dioxide and it is also having enzymes like superoxide dismutase and catalase to remove the free radicals in your blood. So let us see some of the applications of artificial cells. So artificial cells as oxygen carrier. So we can have a polyhemoglobin so that will have more amount of oxygen carrying capacity and we can also add SOD that is superoxide dismutase and catalase enzyme so that will remove the free radicals. So here we can use this artificial cells for ischemia okay. So here uh, when there is a arterial obstruction and that will narrow the artery so that will result in stroke and heart attack okay. So the normal RBC which is in the size of 7 to 8 micron in diameter it cannot pass through this small uh, passage okay and due to lack of oxygen there is a high chance for getting the stroke as well as heart attack. So when you use this polyhemoglobin solution it is in the size of nano so it can easily pass through this and it can supply the oxygen but the problem is so if there is a oxygen lack is prolonged so due to reperfusion with an oxygen carrier it can release damaging oxygen radicals so it may produce some oxygen radicals okay so in this case we can use a polyhemoglobin with SOD and catalase enzyme solution so it can supply the oxygen and also it will remove the oxygen radicals it is having dual function okay so let us see how we can use this artificial rbc for cancer therapy so in the normal tissue so it is well perfused with rbc and oxygen but in case of cancer tissue it is under perfused with oxygen but for successful radiation chemotherapy you need oxygen 
So, the normal RBC cannot enter into the cancerous tissue, ok. So, we can use the polyhemoglobin. So, due to its small size, it can easily enter the cancerous tissue and it can increase the oxygen which could be useful for successful chemotherapy and radiation therapy. And another thing is along with the polyhemoglobin, we can also add an enzyme tyrosinase, ok. So, it will remove the tyrosine which is needed for the melanoma growth. So, the first function is it will give the oxygen which is needed for chemotherapy and radiation therapy and it will also remove the tyrosine which is needed for melanoma growth. So, in this way it is suppressing the cancer growth. So, next thing is we can also use it for hemoperfusion. So, if there is a toxin in the patient's blood that could be removed by charcoal filled artificial cells. So, the charcoal can be filled in the artificial cells. So, the toxins in the blood will enter the artificial cells and all the toxins will be adsorbed by the charcoal inside the artificial cells. So, you can see here when you inject the free absorbent what happens is it will remove the toxin, but the problem is uh, our platelet and RBC will go and attack it ok. So, when you encapsulate into artificial cells it is separated from the platelet RBC and WBC and all the particles are inside the artificial cells. So, the toxins can enter inside and it can purify the blood. So, you can see here, here the this one is millions of adsorbent material artificial cells and the patient blood will pass through the uh, artificial cells and the purified blood will be come to the patient. And when compared to the artificial kidney machine, you can see the smallest size. So, this hemoperfusion device containing 70 grams of ultra thin membrane artificial cells which containing activated charcoal and uh, which could be the size could be compared with the artificial kidney machine ok. And it can perform the removal of toxin from the blood. So, which can perform equivalent to this artificial kidney machine and it can remove all the toxin from your blood. And we can also use this artificial cells as a drug delivery vehicles. So, these artificial cells are made up of biodegradable membrane. So, we can add some kind of drugs or therapeutic molecules and this can be uh, released at the particular location. We can target these artificial cells to deliver the drug into the particular location for various therapeutic applications. And these artificial cells can also act like a biosensors, so which will have some analytes ok. So, for example, if there is a uh, glucose level is more in the blood, so it can interact with the glucose and it can produce some kind of fluorescent signal ok. So, these artificial cells can also act like a biosensors. And recent breakthrough is uh, this group they have made a artificial sperm ok. So, nowadays the major problem is infertility ok. So, this research group they have made artificial sperm and they are trying to make also artificial human eggs which could be possible in few years. So, how they created? So, they have created the human sperm from skin cells and uh, they reprogrammed the skin cells by introducing some genes ok. And within a month the skin cell became a germ cell. So, which can be developed into sperm or an egg. So, this artificial is not only for biomedical applications, it can be also useful for non-medical use. For example, it could be useful for cosmetic as well as food production and other application. And also, these artificial cells can also be useful for energy production by artificial photosynthesis. And these are some of the usual websites if you want to get more information about the artificial cells. So, before I conclude, I want to discuss the another area that is synthetic or minimal bacterial cells. So, this is different from the artificial cell. So, let us see what is synthetic or minimal bacterial cell. So, here the synthetic cell is a cell that operates with a chemically synthesized genome and the minimal bacterial cell is a cell. So, it contains only the genes that are necessary and sufficient to ensure continuous growth under ideal laboratory conditions. So, this article is published in science in 2007 ok. So, they have done the genome transplantation in bacteria. So, it will lead to changing from one species to another species. So, this kind of research was done by uh, Craig Mentor group ok. So, they, they changed it from mycoplasma mycoids to mycoplasma capricolum. So, there is another research published by the same group Craig Mentor group ok. So, this was published in science 2010. So, they created a bacterial cell which could be controlled by a chemically synthesized genome. So, let us see the details. 
So why to make a minimal cell? So to define a minimal set of genetic function essential for life under ideal laboratory condition and to discover the set of genes of currently unknown function that are essential to determine their function and to have a simple system for whole cell modeling and to modelize the genes for each process in the cell okay? and to design a cell from those modules and to build more complex cells by adding new functional modules. So the overall idea is so we can make a minimal set of genetic functions okay, which is essential for the survival of the cell and we can also use as a model system to understand if you have x gene what will be the function, if you have y gene what will be the function. So it will act like a simple model system to understand the function of each and every gene. So for making the minimal bacterial cell, researchers at Craig Venter Institute, they have selected mycoplasma mycoids because it has a small genome which is only 1 MB okay, and it can be easily grown in the laboratory and we can easily synthesize this genome and we can also isolate the synthetic genome from the yeast okay. and there are, they have several tools to uh, genetically engineer its genome. So that is why they selected this mycoplasma mycoids for making the minimal bacterial cell. So how to make this minimal bacterial cell? There are two approaches, one is top down approach, another one is bottom up approach. Okay. So the top down approach is start with the full size uh, viable bacteria then remove the genes and clusters of genes one at a time and at each step retest for viability and only proceed to next step if the presenting construction is viable and the doubling time is approximately normal. So you can take the bacteria okay, and remove a particular part of gene and just check it whether the bacteria is viable and the doubling time is normal. So then only you can proceed to next step. So that is called as top down approach from the whole genome you are cutting down small small pieces of genome or you are removing the small small piece of genome and you are making the minimal genome okay. and next approach is bottom up approach. Okay. So make our best guess to the genetic and functional composition of minimal genome and then synthesis it. So the bottom up approach is a random approach. So you can make a guess what are the genes required for the cell to be alive. Okay. So we can take those genes and we can synthesize those genes and put it into the bacteria and we can check it whether the bacteria is alive and how it is performing. Okay. So how they made the minimal cells or synthetic cells? So they taken the natural cell and they taken the genomic DNA and the sequence the genomic DNA and after the sequencing they made their own genome design and they synthesized the genome and all the genomes are assembled in the yeast okay, and the transplant to the recipient cell then the recipient cell genome was degraded then you will get the complete synthetic cell with the minimal genome. So let us see the possible future uses of the synthetic or engineered species. So it will increase the basic understanding of life okay, and also it will increasing the uh, predictability of synthetic biological circuits and it will replace the petrochemical industry, it will make the biofuels okay, and it will enhance the bioremediation and it will also play a major role in material science and it will drive the antibiotic and vaccine discovery and production and we can also use it for gene therapy via stem cell engineering. Okay. So as a summary of this lecture, so in this lecture we have learnt what is artificial cell okay, and how to make uh, enzyme based artificial cell as well as uh, artificial RBC and what are the various applications of these artificial cells, how it can be useful for cancer therapy and how it could be useful for enzyme therapy and we have also learnt what is synthetic cell and what is minimal bacterial cell and also its various applications. So I will end my lecture here, I thank you all for listening to this lecture, I will see you in another interesting lecture.